Let's give the Lord one more praise all over the house. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. You can be seated, God's beautiful people. Pastor Joanne and I love you so much. And it really is the Lord. How many of you feel the Lord? Two of you. How many of you feel the Lord? Does anybody else feel the Lord? If it's just me, that's fine. I just, but I, I feel the presence of the Lord. And I want to encourage you this year to um, put God first more than ever before. And there's some things we're going to be doing as a church family that are beautiful. And one is 21 days of prayer and fasting. And uh, this is not something your flesh is going to want to do, but this is spirit. And we start, we start our fast tomorrow. Everybody say tomorrow. And so all, we're going to be doing the Daniel fast from the book of Daniel. And this is, um, this is the direction that the Lord has laid on our heart. And we're partnering with churches all over the world doing this. Um, and I know what we're talking about here in getting closer to Jesus is not some catchy, cool sermon series. But what I'm teaching you will keep you to the end. The race is not given to the swift nor the strong but unto him that endureth to the end. How many of you want to finish well? Well. We live to hear these words. Well done. Thou good and faithful servant. How many of you want to hear those words? So everything you do this year, ask yourself those, that question, is this going to help me hear those words? It's just going to help me hear those words. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. And not only that, but what we're teaching you will keep your soul. And it's going to bless you in not just this life, but in the age to come. How many of you want to be close to Jesus for all eternity? And we say that, but, you know, your, the relationship you have with him now and the time you spend with him now is determining your proximity to him for all of eternity. I don't want to just be in heaven. I want to be close to Jesus. You think, well, it's not going to matter. It's going to matter. It's going to matter. It's going to matter. We store up treasure in heaven. It's going to matter. I don't want the Lord to show me these are all the things I wanted to give you, but you refused to take it. How many of you want everything that God has for you? Everything. I want to leave nothing on the table. I want to be close to him. You know who's closest to him in eternity? The Bible tells you around the throne are the martyrs. Those who gave their life for the cause of Christ. They have a front row seat with Jesus for all of eternity. I want to be close to the Lord. And so there's 21 days of prayer and fasting, the Daniel fast. There'll be stuff on the website. Um, one of my pastors, mentors, Pastor Jensen Franklin, we partner with him, all kinds of information, books, but there'll be lots of links on there, but it's basically no meat, um, no sugar, no bread, nothing desirable. That's what, that's the Bible, it says that in Daniel. He ate nothing desirable for 21 days. But you know what it says? I actually pulled it up. Let me, sh let me share this with you. Daniel. Uh, Daniel 10. Daniel. Daniel 10, I think it's verse 11. It says, and he said unto me, O man, Everybody say, Daniel ate nothing desirable. But then in verse 
Verse 11, it says, And the Lord said unto me, O, o Daniel, a man greatly desired. He ate nothing desirable, but he became greatly desired. How many of you would love for God to say, you are greatly desired? What did he do to get that? He ate nothing desirable. He gave that up to hear the Lord say, you are greatly desired. This is the heart of God. And this is, this is very important to the Lord. And so we're going to be doing 21 days of prayer and fasting. We've done that for years, but the thing we're doing that we've not done before is we're opening up our church at 6 a.m., both campuses, 6 a.m. for 21 days for prayer. So I never get an amen about that. <laughs> six, everybody say 6 a.m. 6 a.m. prayer. This room will be open, and Jesus will be here. And, uh, and at our Spring Lake Park campus as well, we're opening it up for 20 21 days of prayer. I will be here. And uh, it's going to be beautiful what God's going to do. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray. How many of you want to be a part of a church that's known for prayer? If you don't like to pray, you're not going to like it here at all. Because we, we want to be known for prayer, not preaching. We don't want to be known because of a pastor or a preacher. We want to be known because of prayer. Prayer. Prayer changes things. Prayer changes you. Fasting and prayer makes you aware of who you are and makes you aware of who God is. How many of you this year want to be more aware of who you are and who God is in your life? Yeah, this is why we do this. This is very important. It makes you aware of your identity. Who you are in Christ. What was the temptation that Satan gave Jesus constantly? It was over his identity. Remember when Jesus went into the wilderness to fast for 40 days? What was the temptation? If thou be the Son of God. If thou be the Son of God. If thou, It was on his identity. You get your identity through fasting and prayer, through getting close to the Lord. Your identity. This is why everybody who says, oh, I'm this identity now, I'm this, and they got all kinds of pronouns and all this kind of stuff, they don't get that through fasting and prayer. You get your identity from spending time with the one who made you. Jesus. Praise the Lord. And so we're going to lean into 21 days of prayer and fasting. And then we have my, our presence conference. My pastor, Pastor Ivan, is going to be here with his wife and daughter. How many of you love Pastor Ivan? They run our orphanage in Guatemala. They're going to be here. It is beautiful. So he's going to be ending the fast with us. And so I'm believing God for miracles. And then we're going to pour the end of the month into our marriages with Gary Chapman. How many of you know Gary Chapman from the Five Love Languages wrote that book. He's going to be here. It's going to be beautiful. Okay? And so this is a whole month focused on our walk with Jesus, prayer, fasting, getting up early, spending time with the Lord, giving God the first of our day. The first. Not, do, do, do not give the first of your day to social media. Do not give the first of your day to your email. Don't give it to anybody, give it to Jesus. So you get up, four o'clock, five o'clock, you get up, you spend time with the Lord, an hour with the Lord. Jesus got on to the disciples because he said, you couldn't pray at least one hour? Tarry with me one hour. It's the minimum. And so if you work out, you gotta work out an hour, you can't work out 10 minutes. Come on, am I right? At least an hour. You got to go in and start. I'm, I'm, I'm in there five days a week. Last week, I was in there with six. Pastor Joanne went with me. Somebody say amen about it. She went with me every day last week. It's exhausting. It's awful. And I've been, in, I've been working out now uh, almost nine months. Right? And you just slight, slight this, a little bit here. That's a little better. There's a little improvement there. So, so it's a commitment to the Lord. If you want to be like Jesus, spend time with him. 
How will I know when I'm like Jesus? Your spouse will tell you. <laughs> wow, you are like the Lord. You're very patient today and forgiving and loving and kind. And you like su long suffer. You have like the fruit of the Spirit. This is unbelievable. Amen. How many of you want your spouse to be like Jesus? Go spend time with the Lord. How many of you want your kids to be like Jesus? Spend time with the Lord. Amen? So let's do that. This is the first of the year. Everybody lift one hand. Say it like you mean it. Say in Jesus' name, I sow a seed of faith into good ground. Let this year be the year that I become more like you. In Jesus' name. Now let's give God praise for it. Come on, all over the house. Okay, go with me in your Bibles to 1 Kings. Chapter 7. I want to talk to you about something. 1 Kings chapter 7. And I want to talk to you about the temple that Solomon built briefly. And Solomon built a temple. It took him seven and a half years. 80,000 people worked just in the, the rock quarry, about 120,000 altogether, to build the temple, working night and day. And a masterful, masterful building. But let's look here at verse 13 of chapter 7. And King Solomon sent and brought Hiram and Tyre and was the son of a widow from the tribe of Napoli. And his father was a man. He was a bronze worker and he was filled with wisdom. How many of you want, how many of you want to be filled with wisdom? How many, how many people are, are just tired of making bad decisions? It's just, God, for, deliver me from bad decisions. Wisdom. And he worked, he was a bronze worker. And he worked and came to the king and did all of his work there. And basically what he did in verse 15, 16, 17, 18, is it talks about how he built these two massive columns that were in front of the, the temple. These two, they were 34 and a half feet tall, made out of bronze, covered in gold. Massively intricate columns. The columns that were so big and beautiful, they actually gave them names. One meant God will establish his strength amongst the people. Just massive columns. And then the verse I want to hone in on is verse 19. And the capitals, which were on the top of the pillars. Where were they? On the top. Where were they? Top. On the top of the pillars in the hall were in the shape of lilies. Everybody say lilies. lilies. Now let's, let's talk about this a little bit. Because um, I think this is special. Um, Hiram created these beautiful, intricate um, lilies which were on the very top of these pillars. I think they have a picture. Put the picture of the tabernacle up for me. There you see the two columns. And you can see the, the crowning around them and the, the, the pillars. And on the very top that you cannot see, in, in the top, was he created these gold lilies. And it took him not just days, not just weeks, not just months. It took him uh, years to make these gold lilies that went on the very top of these pillars that stood out front of the temple. And they were covered in brass, these columns were covered in brass and then coated in gold. And what was happening was 
Hiram was doing something so important here because he realized that what he was doing, he was doing for the Lord. And his father was not a man of faith. His father was an idol worshiper, but he was very skilled, very gifted. His mother actually was a woman of faith, but his father passed down the skill to him. And when he uh, was chosen, he chose, he said, this year I'm going to give a year of my life and I'm going to use my gifts and my talents and my abilities to build the kingdom of God. That's what he said he's going to do. He said, I'm going to give it to build the kingdom of God. Young people, give your youth to Jesus. I have teenagers at home. If, if you really look at how long you live and then you look at how long you're a teenager, your teenage years are really the tithe of your life. Most teenagers go, I don't have a job, I, don't, I can't tithe. Your tithe to Jesus is your, is your youth. Give Jesus your teenage years as the tithe of your life. How many of you right now wish if you could go back, you'd have given the Lord the tithe of your life, your teenage years to Jesus? Look at the hands, young people. Look at the hands. They wish they could have done what you have the ability to do now. Give your youth to the Lord. To say, God, this is the first year of me not being a little child. I'm going to give all of these years to you as the first of your, of your, your life. Praise the Lord. And this, this man, Hiram said, I'm going to give my gifts, my talents, and abilities to Jesus. And when he built these, he put these on the very top. The Lord told him to put them on the top. And nobody could see it. Nobody could see it. Now, how many of you decorate your attics? <laughs> Most of you, your attic probably looks like mine. It's got studs showing and insulation, and maybe there's some Christmas decorations up there. And, but nobody decorates it unless you're crazy, I guess, or you're going to be up there. But Most of the stuff that we put a lot of time and effort into, we want everybody to see. But when he built this, he put the lilies on top and the lilies were there in secret because nobody, nobody saw them. Everybody just looked from the bottom up, but God looked from the top down. And he did it for the Lord. This is what fasting and prayer is. Fasting and prayer makes you very focused and in love with the unseen. Most people want everything they do for the Lord to be seen. Imagine going home and creating the most beautiful thing that you spent years on. It's one of the most valuable things you'd ever built. And you go, I'm never going to show it to anybody because it's just for Jesus. Can you imagine doing that? What if our best prayers were in private? What if our best worship was in private? Because God who lives in secret, see God is into the secret. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. He even says when you, when you pray. This is how Jesus told us to pray. He said when you pray, not if. When. When you pray, go into your room Shut the door. How many of you have a door? Shut the door. And your father who is in secret. So the key is to understand that, that God lives in secret. And when you go in to secret, he's already there. Your father who is in secret will see you in secret and reward you Publicly. We want to show everything in public. But God is saying, no, no, no. Fall in love with the secret. This is what fasting does. See, we want to post pictures of food. Post pictures of fasting. Post pictures of an empty plate. 
We don't post pictures of fasting. We don't post pictures of prayer. You've never been in the presence of God and on Instagram at the same time. Instagram can't get in the presence of God. When you go into the presence of God, you go alone. You go by yourself. What he's doing is he is building something for the Lord. Making something that brings honor to God in private. Everybody thinks God cares more about your public. God cares about your private. God cares more about what you do in private than public. And I don't mean just he doesn't want me to sin in private. He, he wants your best worship in private. He wants your best prayer in private. Your, use your gifts in private. How many of you want to use your gifts for the glory of God? God gave them to you. You don't have to just use them in church on Sunday. You're only here a couple hours a week. You take your gift with you 24-7. Everywhere you go, you take your gift. Use your gifts for the kingdom of God. How many of you want to use your gifts this year for the kingdom of God? I'm not just talking about church. I'm talking about the kingdom. Come on, can I get an amen about that? Use your gifts for the kingdom of God. All the time. The further the kingdom of God. And he says, the God who sees in the unseen part cares about the part that people don't see. When man looks at the outward appearance, God looketh at the, the heart. I can see you. I can't see your heart. Guess what God sees when he sees you? Your heart. Even, he even got onto the church for worshiping because they weren't worshiping with their heart. He says, you praise me with your mouth, but your heart is far from me. So that even when you're in church and you're singing songs, God's looking at your heart. Is your heart far from me? Yeah, I hear you singing a song, but your heart, God cares about the posture of your heart. Where is our heart Monday morning at 5 a.m.? Where's our heart Monday morning at 6 a.m.? Where's our heart? Where's our heart? It's a heart posture to the Lord. To say, God, this is not about me receiving any glory, any accolade. I am doing something that only you would see. Because those those pillars were the temple. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Everybody say, I'm the temple. We just got through praying that a couple minutes ago. That sickness is illegal in my body. My body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Well, if your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, where's the lily in your life? Where's the lily in your life? Where's the thing that you work diligently on that nobody sees but Jesus? Where's the thing that you give to God that nobody would know but the Lord? Where's your lily? People may see this, they see my fame, they see this, they see this, they see this, but they don't see the lily. Where's the lily? And in order to be complete in the temple, you had to have the lily. It's not just showing up and looking good and strong on Sunday morning. Wow, that's the pillar, but where's the lily? that only Jesus sees. God is interested in the moments of life that nobody knows but him. What are we praying? And when we fast and we pray, we're saying, God, I need you more than anything else. And this year, I went to the Lord and I just said, God, it's a clean slate. I cannot pastor I cannot do business. I cannot travel and preach on parenting or do books or be married, parent eight children without you. I am going to utterly fail. So I need your anointing. I need your wisdom. I need your insight. I need your knowledge. I need your counsel. 
I need the fear of God. I need holiness. These are the seven spirits of God that we pray in the tabernacle prayer. How many of you need all of them? Amen. Everybody say that. We say, Lord, I need your counsel. I need your wisdom. I need your knowledge. I need the fear of God. I need holiness. These are all the things that we need that only come from Jesus. And it's really the lily work of Christianity is what fasting is. Every time you get that hunger pain, starting tomorrow, or you see I want to eat that, just that's another little piece. It's another little intricate. That's another, for you, Jesus. For you, Jesus. For you, Jesus. Nobody sees it but Jesus. Nobody knows how you feel when you're hungry like Jesus. You ever been hurting and pain and you try and tell somebody how, you, how it feels and they look back at you and you can tell, if you felt how I felt, you would act different. Has anybody ever felt like that? I know all the mamas have felt like that at some point, right? But Jesus feels what you feel. He knows how you feel. He is touched by the feelings of our infirmities. And we just say, this year, Lord, we want you. That's what fasting is. It's making the lilies of your life. Let's go to the book of Luke. I'm almost done. The book of Luke. This is Jesus showing up in the flesh, and he talks about it in Luke chapter 27. You guys know a famous verse. This is Jesus. How many of you believe the words of Jesus? Amen. 27, he says, consider the lilies. Jesus says that. He says, consider the what? The lilies, how they grow, how they neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you, even Solomon, there it is, Solomon's temple. Because Jesus knew about the lilies. Why? Because he was, before Abraham was, I am. He was there. He says, even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. They don't toil, they don't spin, they don't, it's effortless. When you put God first in your life and you have a lily in your life, that secret place in prayer and fasting between you and Jesus, all of the effort and labor is gone. And you don't operate from a position of balance. I was just in Atlanta on Wednesday teaching on parenting. I always get asked this question. They say, how do you balance? And I go, I don't. And I don't try. I yield. The only way our family works is we all have to surrender to Jesus. If we don't surrender to Jesus, what we'll try and do is balance. When people use the word balance, it's, it's people taking the reins. And they're trying to balance marriage and balance parenting and balance, 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 balance. And it's them trying to do it. You can't do it. You have to surrender. You let go. And we all die at the cross. And then Christ lives in us, and that's how we make it work. And when one of us in the family doesn't pray, it doesn't work. Right now, Augustine and Winston are not saved. The twins. So if Nicholas doesn't pray one day, it creates problems in our home. If Alexander doesn't pray, it creates problems at home. If dad doesn't pray, now we have problems. Because now we're in our flesh. The only way it works is surrender. Everybody say surrender. The kingdom is not the kingdom of try hard. That's balance. It's a kingdom of surrender, of yield, of Christ living through you. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who died and gave himself for me. And I count everything that I have and have accomplished as dung that I might have him. This is, this is the only way to survive. Consider the lilies. So this, this 21 days, I want you to consider the lilies. Everybody say, consider the lilies. Consider the lilies. Consider the lilies. This is the heart of God for our family and for our church. 
And I already read you out of Daniel. Now let's go to Joel. We're going to end in Joel. Everybody go with me to Joel. Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. Is this helping anybody? God cares about the part of you that nobody sees. I tell you all the time, you ought to have things that God tells you that you write in a journal that your children read about you when you die. Nobody knew it. Nobody knew it. It was between me and the Lord. Isn't that beautiful? You gotta have some lilies in your life. This is what comes through fasting and prayer. And it's gonna be hard. Your, your body's gonna die. That's the key word. But you're gonna get an identity in Christ. I'm believing God to come to me in visions and dreams. How many of you want the Lord to show you some beautiful things in Revelation? How many of you need God to reveal some parenting strategies to you? How many of you have some strong-willed children? I can't be the only parent in here with a strong-willed child. Does anybody else have a strong-willed child? Yeah, then you need a divine strategy from the Lord. You're not going to find it on TikTok. You're not going to find it on an Instagram reel. You're going to find it in a dream on a vision from the Lord. This is, this is how Samson's parents got the vision from the angel of the Lord and how to raise Samson. This is how Mary and Joseph knew how to raise Jesus from the vision from the angel of the Lord. If it was good enough for Mary and Joseph, it's good enough for us. Let's parent like Jesus' parents. We need this. So Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2, verse 12. It says, now therefore, saith the Lord, turn to me. Everybody say, "Turn turn to me. With all your heart, with fasting and weeping and with mourning. You ain't mourn, you're not mourning yet? Wait till about. Wait till about Tuesday. <laughs> about Tuesday, Wednesday. This verse, you're going to start living this verse. Okay? Turn to me with all your heart, with fasting. What was the first one? With fasting. Turn to me with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. So rend your hearts, not your garments. Like rip your hearts not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and great kindness. He will relent from doing harm. He he knows if he will turn and relent and leave a blessing. Who knows if he will turn and relent and leave a blessing? You know what this is saying? God is saying, if you will fast, instead of me disciplining you because of what you won't stop, I might change my mind about it. And leave a blessing instead of whooping you. Amen. You know why? See, some of y'all, you don't, some of y'all was, you wasn't disciplined growing up. Let me tell you, the Lord is a good father. And he will discipline, the Bible says, for those the Lord loves, he disciplines. Some of y'all can't say amen because some of y'all never been, you ain't been spanked till God picks a switch. How many of you ever had God pick a switch on you? Some of y'all don't know about a switch either. My mama had a switch bush in the yard. For those the Lord loves, he disciplines. And God says, listen to me, if you will repent and come back to me, I might change my mind and not take you through what I was going to take you through. Another verse says, if we would judge ourselves, we'd have no need to be judged. See, because you know when God's dealing with you on something. You know when there's something you need to give, give to God. Just right now, can we be honest? How many of you right now have something in your own life that you know God's dealing with you on? Just raise your hand. Something. Yeah, look, at God's saying, if you, if you will deal with it, if you will give it to me, I won't take you through everything I'm going to take you through because God will deal with you because you're his child. It's like Jonah getting on. Ask Jonah. God didn't care that that cruise ship was going to Tarshish. All them people's going to Tarshish, God didn't have a problem with it. But if you get on that boat, 
if you get on that boat, after I told you not to, I'm going to call a whirlwind to come get you. Because you are my child. That's how you know you're his. Some of y'all can't get away with nothing. <laughs> Quit trying. Some of y'all are terrible at sinning because you're his child. Every time you do it, you get in trouble. Every time you do it, you get caught. Every time you do it, your life falls apart because he is your father. I got little ring cameras up in my house to, to watch on the kids. God, you can't hide from God. Where are you going to go? The Bible even said, where can you go? If you took the wings of the morning and flew to the uttermost parts of the earth, he's still there. That's what the word said. If you make your bed in hell, he's still there. Where can you go? You're his child. So why don't you just relent from it? Just say this year, you know what? I've been sinning for 20 years. I'm terrible at it. I'm no good at it. Even the world, some of y'all, the world doesn't embrace you. The world doesn't even like you because you're God's child. You keep trying to get the world to like you, and the world's like, we hate you. You're annoying. We don't want to hang out with you. We don't like getting high with you. We don't like getting drunk with you. And you keep, you keep getting sad because the world rejects you. You belong to Jesus. You do not belong to this world. That's why they reject you. And you keep trying to sin worse to get to fit in. You're never going to fit in because you don't belong there. And you got a mama who has the Holy Ghost. And she's praying over you. So you don't stand a chance. Just quit sinning. You're not good at lying. You're bad at it. So just don't lie. Just be good at what you're good at, telling the truth. Come on, amen. You're really great at being sober. And you're a terrible drunk. So he says, who's to say God wouldn't leave you a blessing? Blow the trumpet in Zion. Consecrate a fast. What does it say? Consecrate a what? Con this is the word of the Lord to the church. Consecrate a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Everybody say a solemn assembly. So we've done that. We have prayer tonight at 430 at both campuses. We've called a solemn assembly. Anytime you hear pastors say we're calling a solemn assembly, that's what that is. This is where we, we find that. Okay, so tonight at 4.30, we've called a solemn assembly for prayer. He says, gather the people. Everybody say, gather the people. Yes. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children, the nursing baby. He says, let the bridegroom go out from his chamber and the bride and her dressing room. Let the priests and the ministers of the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare the people, O Lord, and do not... Give your heritage reproach that the nations should rule over them. Why should they say among the people, where is their God? Verse 18, then the Lord will be zealous for his land and pity for his people. The Lord will answer and say to his people, behold, I will send you grain and new wine and oil. How many of you want that in your life? And you'll be satisfied by them. You will no longer and will no longer make you a reproach among any nations Verse 23, and be glad, you children of Zion, and rejoice to the Lord. Verse 24, the, the threshing floor shall be full of wheat, and your vats shall overflow with new wine and oil. So I will restore unto you the years. These are promises that come when you fast and pray. How many of you want the Lord to restore the years? Oh, my God, only the Lord can restore years. How many of you wasted years fighting people when you should have fought the enemy? How many of you wasted your youth, wasted years feeling sorry for yourself when you should have drawn your sword and fought? The, God can restore the years. Not just give you money, not just give you things. God can give you your life back. Everything you lost in your 30s, God can give it back to you. Everything you lost in your 50s, God can give it back to you. As if it never happened. As if it never happened. This is what comes when you fast and pray. God will restore unto you the years that the locusts 
have eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, the chewing locust, and a great army which shall, which I sent among you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dwelt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be put to shame. When you fast and pray, God delivers you from shame. The shame. Some of us live with so much shame of our past, what we did, what we should have done, what we didn't do. How many of you want to be free from shame this year? Free from shame. Then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. How many of you want your kids to prophesy? This comes through fasting and prayer. These are all promises through fasting and prayer. Your, your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall dream dreams. Your old men shall see visions. And also on my uh, men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. This is the promise of God to the church if they will turn to the Lord in fasting and in prayer. Now, we're not doing it because it's a great church, church growth strategy. But we, we retired from that. We're not trying to grow church anymore. Praise God. Isn't that great just knowing there's nobody here trying to grow a church? Isn't that freeing? We let the Lord do that. He said he would build the church. Amen? Amen. So we don't have to worry about any of that. All we have to worry about is seeking him. Seek him. Lift him up. And this is the promise that come upon your heart and your life. And some of you have never fasted before. This may be your first time. Um, every time you feel that desire to eat this or, or hunger pain, you just go to the Lord. I call it your prayer reminder. Oh, I'm hungry. Oh, it's time to pray. That's what that means. Amen? And if you have health concerns, then modify the fast to do whatever you have to do. You know, um, but this is not about fasting your, your Instagram. We're not talking about that. Any fast in the Bible had to do with food. So this is, this is what we're honing in as a church. And then we're going to open it up for prayer and consecration and go to the Lord. And again, I'm not talking to you about coming to church more. I'm not talking to you about giving more. I'm not talking to you about serving more. I'm talking to you about you and Jesus. You and your personal walk with the Lord. And let me tell you, there's just some things that will not be done if we don't fast. There's some things that just will not be done if we, don't, if we don't pray. And we're calling the church to it. This is the first of the year. I want this to be the greatest year of my life so far. How do you really want God to use you? I want God to use you. I want, I want his presence in the room, in our house. I want it in my children. I want my children. And let, me, let me read something to you. For all of you who feel too busy, this is a study done by the New England Journal of Medicine. Because most most of us feel too busy when you have kids. Most men from 40 to 60, um, you're getting up, you're like, I got to make this happen. I got to make the paper. I've got to build a brand. I'm building a company. I've got to work hard. I'm not lazy. I've got a strong work ethic. So this is where most men are from 20 to 40, okay? Most women from 20 to 40 are not like that. They're focused on character development. They're mainly focused on their family, their children. Um, they're, they're not, they're, I'm, not, I'm not saying that they're lazy by any means. They're just not pursuing the things that the man is pursuing. They have a, a different lean. Most women, it's character, children, family, marriage. It tends to flip at 40. 
At 40, the women now, the kids are a little older, some of them are leaving the house, they're ready to be CEOs because they spent 20 years focused on character development. The men now at 40 realize that money's not everything. A lot of them have lost their marriages and the children are grown by the time they realize it, it's too late to go back and reparent. So here's what I want you to, to see from this study. An extensive study in the United States found that the most productive age in human life is between 60 to 70 years of age. The most productive, the most money you're ever going to make, the most wealth you'll ever bring in your life is between 60 to 70. The second most productive stage of human life is 70 to 80. Your second season is 70 to 80. Your third season is 50 to 60. The average age of most Nobel Peace Prize winners is 62. The average age of most prominent CEOs and presidents of companies is 63. The average age of pastors of the 100 largest churches in America is 71. This has been determined this tells us in a way, and it has been determined that the best years of your life and most productive financial years of your life are between 60 to 80 years of age. And so if you sacrifice your time with Jesus, if you sacrifice fasting, prayer, parenting, your marriage from 20 to 40, you're doing it for the least money you'll ever make in your life. You're selling your birthright for a bowl of soup. I'm saying these are the years to focus on Jesus. These are the years to develop who you are in Christ. These are the years to pour into your marriage, to pour into your children when you're young. It's not, I gotta do it, I'll do it later. I'll get to it later. I'll get, no, 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 you're not gonna get to it later. The money will come later. When you can afford whatever it is that you're dreaming of, what good is it to have it and you've lost the whole reason you wanted it? Was for them. Focus on your time with Jesus. I know what I'm saying is not popular. I know what I'm saying is not. What I'm saying will help you survive. And it will help you go the distance in Jesus. When you're 50 and 60, I still have my wife. I still got my kids. I still got them. They love Jesus. They're walking with Jesus. Everybody's closer to Jesus. Because what you're focusing on now, build the lilies now. But nobody sees it. God sees it. Build the lilies now. I know you got a business. Build the lilies now. But I want everybody to see, build the lilies now. Consider the lilies, how they neither toil nor spin. They rest. And none of them are as, are as wonderful. Solomon in all his glory, none of them are as wonderful as this because God sees it. This is what fasting does. Fasting makes you aware of your priorities and it makes you hungry for the things that nobody can see but Jesus. Did you get something out of this today? Come on, can you give the Lord a praise? So stand with me. We're gonna pray. We've prayed for the sick today. We've prayed for miracles. We have worshiped the Lord. Come on, you guys worship today for almost an hour. Somebody say amen about that. We worship. We've done communion. We've repented. We've learned about prayer and fasting. Jesus was lifted up today. Amen. We gave to the Lord our tithe and offering. We put God first. This is the beauty of the church. This is the church. And if you're visiting, we'd love to get to know you. More importantly, we'd love to help you get to know Jesus. And that's our heart's prayer. That's our heart's dream for every single person 
And tonight our church will be open at 4.30 for an hour of prayer. So would you lift your hands? Let me pray a blessing over you. Father, I bless the people of God. I thank you for the work of the cross. I thank you for what you did here today. Thank you, God, that every person that we prayed for at these altars and we anointed with oil, you're already at work in that situation. Thank you, Lord, that as every person gave today, God, that you're already opening the windows of heaven over their life. Lord, as we go into prayer tonight, I ask that you would move and do miracles. As we get up in the morning, as we fast and as we pray for these 21 days, Lord, I ask that you would see the lilies of our life, that you would restore the years that the palmer worm and canker worm and locusts have eaten up, that we would never live in shame, and that we would value the years that you've given us. Teach us to number our days. And I thank you for what you did today. And now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and present you blameless before the throne, I bless you in Jesus' name. And the church said, amen. amen. Come on, give God a big praise all over the house. I love you, church. I'll see you real soon.